ask you to turn with me to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. Discipline is hard. Self-discipline is a struggle for many. Diets and exercise and regular routines, even vigilance over sins, these all require that we impose some level of regular structure on our natural tendency toward irregular and self-pleasing chaos. And then there is the discipline that is imposed upon us by others. The boss who requires us to be at the office at a certain time. The spouse who expects our meals at a certain time. Parents who mete out consequences when expectations and demands are not met. All of these fit under the Bible word for discipline. And then there is the carefully thought through, lovingly implemented instruction, correction, and consequences that we associate with parenting and child rearing. This is the God ordained how to, shapes hearts through teaching, through commands, through consequences, and even through corporal punishment. Biblical discipline then involves a path to follow. And pain when the path is not followed. You see, there is a sense of safe rest when children stay on the path. There's trouble and there is pain when children get off the path. See, the Bible places a great deal of the pain and hardship that God's people experience in this category of discipline. Those who received this book, the original recipients of the book of Hebrews, had to know how they were going to think about some of the hardness and hardships of their lives. That way, they would respond with, to those things in a way that was pleasing to the Lord. That is what this chapter is all about. One writer has commented, quote, the book of Hebrews is a very mature and sober book when it comes to the pain and stress of Christian living and the endurance that it takes to run the race, to fight and finish well. It's not a book that people, especially teenagers and young adults, gravitate towards unless they have suffered and struggled for some explanation of how that struggle relates to God. In other words, the more easy and pain-free your life has been, the less you're going to cherish the kind of spirituality taught in this book. And the more you have suffered, and the more you will cling to its precious teachings, if you're willing to believe them, end quote. And that is a big if. Many people, even many preachers, who simply do not believe what this chapter teaches. Oh, they know it. They know it's in the Bible. They don't believe it. It's not a little feel-good chapter. It's not about how to make the best of your troubles or even about how God makes the best of your troubles. It is a massive statement about the gracious sovereignty of God over the evil that often befalls his people. And the big if is, will you believe this? Will you accept the mystery of God's providence in the pain of your life? And will you be trained by it for the sake of good and peace and holiness and righteousness and even living? Or will you kick against this chapter and demand in the season of suffering that God give a greater account of himself than he does in Hebrews 12? 
There's a great old Puritan who has written a book called The Mute Christian Under the Rod. I doubt such a book could even be published today. It would not be accepted. And yet that author helps us wrestle with so many difficult things. Well, Our author begins by causing us to think deeply about Jesus, for he is our pattern for enduring. He writes, Hebrews 12, verse 1, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. And here it is, looking to Jesus, the founder or the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, is seated at the right hand of God. Consider him. Think deeply about him. Look hard at Jesus' life. Who endured from sinners such hostility against himself to this end. So that you may not grow weary or faint hearted. This is always the best place to begin in our hardships. Fix your eyes on Jesus. Think deeply about him what is it then that this does for us see I believe there are two kinds of hardship that are in view here our suffering hardship comes in two primary categories in verse 2 there is the hardship of sacrifice there is a kind of hardship that is related to the cross It's the kind of hardship that comes as we take up our cross, as Jesus did. It is suffering that comes when we hear the call and heed the summons to come and die. We look at the gain and the glory and we weigh it against the pain and hardness and the suffering and we choose the course that may well lead through dark valleys we take up our cross as a true disciple and we choose a path of suffering that's the first thing that we observe in Jesus he went to the cross he took up his cross he went there voluntarily he gave his life for the sake of others this is the essence of sacrifice And so there is a kind of suffering that comes as a result of choosing to pour out our lives for others. We think of this as a higher life, as an optional thing. But Jesus said, in the face of so many who volunteered after doing something else first, if you will not take up your cross, you cannot be my disciple. This is basic, ordinary discipleship. And then there is the hardship from sinners in verse 3. There's a kind of hardship that comes from sinners opposing us. In their case, it was the pressure of sinful men. They were being plundered. They were being pressured. They were being threatened. They were being persecuted. The hardship became because of the hostile will of sinful men. There was almost unimaginable stress. Some of you know this. You know for your faith you are sometimes ridiculed and mocked and teased. And sometimes for the sake of holiness you are openly opposed. And some of this may be at work. Some of it may well be at home. And someday it may well come from mob violence. Or religious fanatics. Or we hope never but from our government. What are our problems then in hardship? Sometimes when you read the stories of suffering saints from the past, it's easy to get a sort of rosy picture of it. They're heroes. Of course they go through this. Of course they are magnificent saints. 
We think they face the hardship of sacrifice and sinners with just amazing calm and grace. That was not so. It wasn't so with Jeremiah. He reached a point where he said, Okay, God, if this is the way it's going to be, I quit. I'm done. Thank you. Next sentence. But the word of God was in my heart as a burning fire. And I could not. God came to Ezekiel and said, Tomorrow, I don't want you to cry. I want you to put it on your turban. I want you to put it on your coat. And I want you to stand on your front steps and I want you to preach this message to Israel. The next sentence. And in the night, my wife died. And I got up in the morning and I washed myself and I put on my turban and I put on my cloak and I stood on my steps and I said these words. It wasn't easy. It wasn't sparkling hard and sometimes it's not faced with amazing calm and grace it had not been so with these saints in, in the book of Hebrews it was not so with the original hearers and sometimes it's not so with us as well verse 3 <clears throat> Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. In your struggle against sin, you've not resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord or be weary when you are reproved by him. The hardships that they were experiencing were dangerous because of how they were responding, beginning to respond to them. And our author here points us to three real perils in the midst of Christian difficulty and in the midst of Christ's discipline of us. Do you see the first one? Verse 3, we become discouraged. Ever been there? I have to become discouraged. There's a great danger in the midst of hardship that comes by sacrifice or from sinners and is that we will grow weary and we will lose heart and we will fail in our souls. It's normal for Christians to have experiences of stress and suffering that threaten their faith and presses too hard or lasts too long or feels almost unbearable and intolerable. But losing heart in the midst of those hardships is a great spiritual danger. To be faint-hearted here is literally to become loose-souled. We've seen how trouble is hard for small-souled People. Now we see how trouble shakes loose souled people. And these Christians were in that danger, as maybe are many of you. The hardship we are going through is accompanied by discouragement and being downcast, or what in our culture and society we call being depressed. <clears throat> when experiencing these affections, what do we tend to do? We tend to quit, to bail out, to seek escape. Discouragement and depression are like constant companions. Why is this such a danger to us? Verse 4, we lose perspective. The point here is that things are bad but not as bad as they could, could be. Now, some of us really hate for people to say that to us. I know it's bad, but it could be worse. Well, no. <laughs> this is as bad as I can take. 
There is hostility and trouble and stress and suffering, but evidently, no martyrs yet. We know from Hebrews 10, 34, that some had been prisoned and some had been plundered, but it is not yet martyrdom, though that could come. The stress level here is huge. How do you sleep at night when being a Christian may result in mob violence? The allusion here is to boxing. In the Greek games, the bare-fisted fighting of their day often drew blood. He is also using the illustrating illustration to point us back to Jesus, who did resist sin, even to the shedding of blood. When? In the Garden of Gethsemane. Let this cup pass, if it be your will. Nevertheless, not my will and your will. And he prayed with such urgency and such trouble that he sweated blood. And he may be pointing to the cross. But more likely he's pointing to Gethsemane. Jesus sweated great drops of blood as he aligned his own will with the will of his Father and chose to endure the suffering and the shame of the cross for the joyous reward that was laid out before him. He did so because of the joy set before him. He chose present suffering in the light of a future reward. And so we'll lose heart. We'll become discouraged when we lose our sense of perspective. We allow the pain of the present to overwhelm our sense of the big picture and the long term. And that is why this book is filled with magnifying Christ. That is why chapter 11, with its faithful men and women enduring hardships. But the third thing is we forget scripture. A great danger is we'll lose heart. A great danger is that we will lose perspective. And all of this is because we have forgotten scripture. Why do we lose heart? Why do we lose perspective? Why do we become overwhelmed by the stress and difficulty of our situation and the suffering of our hardships? Because we have forgotten the truths and exhortations and encouragement that come to us in the Word. We see our author telling them that they are risking losing heart and perspective because they have forgotten a very simple but profound text in Proverbs 3, 11 through 12. This text in Proverbs is nested between trusting the Lord in all our ways. Proverbs 3, 5 through 8, which many of us have memorized and loved. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Acknowledge Him in all your ways, and He will direct your paths. Trust Him. Just trust Him. When? And we honor the Lord with all our wealth, verses 9 through 10. And we find wisdom as the chief end of life, verse 13 of Proverbs. So the chastening hand of God requires three things. It requires trust. It requires obedience. And it leads to wisdom. Now listen to me. The scriptures are more than just a theological textbook or a therapeutic source book. They are the very truths of God that shape our hearts, renew our minds, motivate our wills, and direct our conduct. These people were not finding help and solace and direction from the word they had, so the hardships came to them and threatened them and shook them to the very foundations. They became loose-souled people. I think it's fair to say the believers in this passage are under tremendous stress. They're enduring some form of hostility. They are wrestling with great sorrow and are in danger of growing weary of the battle and losing heart. And these chapters in this whole book is written to keep that from happening. And go back and notice how it's actually written. We are to give careful consideration to Christ in order that, to this purpose, we do not grow weary and faint-hearted. 
train our souls to pay attention to and to think about the Lord Jesus with the aim of encouragement and endurance. I will come to the Lord, listen to him in the word, think on him with meditation, commune with him through prayer and receive grace to be strong and large-souled, to be steady in the midst of suffering. While this grace may come to us through the loving, encouraging, admonishing ministry of people, all of that must point us to Christ, his promises, his purposes, his power, and in this text, his pattern. This is not some mystical looking to Jesus and and we have some image of him in our mind and he speaks to us in some way. That's not it. Looking to Jesus who did this and responded this way and walked a concrete path before us. We look to Jesus in his facing this suffering of the cross and the hostility of sinners. And he responded in this way. This is not mysticism. This is in fact exactly the opposite. It is fiercely and... uh, Don't have an English word for it. It It is practical. So this grace gives us endurance. And it fixes the gaze of the soul on Christ so that we receive power and we gain perspective. If this is what Jesus went through, should not I, his servant and son, expect the same? And so there's our perspective on hardship in verses 5 through 11. The Bible gives us an analogy, a picture, and a reality on our hardships. The suffering we are experiencing is to be endured like a father's discipline. Consider then verses 5 to 11. And you have forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons. My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. Do you believe that? I'm just right here. Do you believe that? God disciplines you. He puts you through the suffering of the cross and the suffering of the sinners. And he's the one doing it. He's the one allowing it. He is doing it on purpose. And he does so because he loves you. And he does so because he's your father. What son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. And besides this, we've had earthly fathers who disciplined us and we respected them. Should we not much more be subject to the father of spirits and live? For they, our fathers, disciplined us for a short time as it seemed best to them. Oh, but he disciplines us. And if I can say always for our good to the end, to this purpose, we may share in his holiness. The moment all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant. Yet later it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Several things we must get into our souls from this text. First, what is going on is God's discipline. In other words, what adversaries do to you out of sinful hostility, God is doing out of fatherly discipline. One preacher put it this way, quote, now this is a very difficult for many. It is somewhat easy to see how God controls circumstances in nature so that he can use them as discipline. I catch a cold in the midst of basking in Bible conference accolades to remind me that I am lowly and needy. And God can control disease and car breakdowns and broken house pipes to bring those kinds of pressures to bear on us to get rid of weights and sins. But what about people? 
Does God control the hostility of sinners against us so that we will be tested over sin? That is exactly what verses 3 and 4 are saying. The hostility of sinners and the hardships of life are both equally under the sovereign control of God. The cold churns and the horrid server at breakfast are both under God's control, bringing testing and discipline as he sees fit and as he deems necessary. And your response to both both exposes, explains, and expresses what's going on in your heart. And many people simply refuse to believe this. But all through the Bible, most clearly in the New Testament, evil men are controlled by God to bring both pain and good to his people. Thus the Egyptian Pharaoh of Moses' day and the Babylonian ruler of Habakkuk, the Roman Pilate of Jesus' trial, and according to to Peter in Acts 2.23, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless people. The author here is helping people to endure by, by teaching them to believe that God is behind everything. Either that or Romans 8.28 is farce. It's God who is working all things together for good to those that love him who are called according to his purpose. Why? Because he has destined us to be like Christ. And you need to embrace this truth. I've drawn much strength, encouragement, hope in the midst of two dark periods in my life. God was at work to chasten and refine me through the open hostility of people in my life. And while it was painful and it was hard, this truth sustained so that by faith and hopefully with all glory to Jesus, I was able to respond with a certain amount of grace and a certain amount of poise. So whether it is the hardship of suffering or the hostility of sinners, <clears throat> all discipline is being designed to determine by God. He is crafting it so it is exactly suited to help you lay aside weights and to help you lay aside sins and to help you, enable you to run with endurance the race he has set before you. That's what this is all about. Do you believe this? And secondly... It reveals relationship, verses 7 through 8. Understand this, hardship and discipline reveal, not conceal, our relationship. The hardships that come from loving disciplines of our Heavenly Father assure us that we are truly His sons. Discipline is for all. It's how we know that we are loved. Oh, how we have this upside down. When God treats us with mercy and grace and he gives us everything we ask for and hope for and he is all about our comforts. and That's when he loves me. But the suffering of the cross and the hardship of people opposed to me? No. Oh, yes. Every son and daughter the father receive is disciplined by the skillful hand guided by the loving holy heart of God. Every child of God receives tra- chastening every one of you. In that great book, The Mute Christian Under the Rod, there's a sentence in it I have never forgotten. He writes... O Christian, kiss the hand that wields the rod. If we are without the distant hand of God, then we are illegitimate. Nice translation, frankly. Cover your ears. We're bastards. We are pretending... What is not so, and that's of grave concern to the author in the book of Hebrews, because several times he addresses people who are there, they're in the room, they're close, they might be connected, they might be okay, they're not real believers. And he looks them straight in the eye and he says, if you have no discipline chastening in your life, I'm sorry, you're not a child of God. 
And so we are pretending what is not so. We are not the true sons of heaven. We are only the lost souls of earth. Will you believe this? Will you look carefully in your life and trace out with joy the disciplining hardships that God has brought you and controls for you and assures you through them that you are his? And will you, as a son under chastening, choose the cross, choose suffering, choose the harder path, Can we, at some point, please stop, stop pursuing our comforts, our ease? And it requires submission, verse 9. If you think that the hardship itself can bring discouragement and depression, what do you think will be the effect of resisting the loving chastening of our great God? If we respect our earthly father's correction, what should be the response to our heavenly father's chastening? See, there's an assumption being made here that many of you did not grow up with. Arthur assumes what it means, one, to have a correcting and chastening father, and secondly, that you responded well to it. It causes me to pause and wonder if so much of our lack of submission to the discipline of God and the disciplines of the faith is because we know so little of it personally and practically. But there's another point here that is easy to miss. Those who submit with reverence to the discipline of God live. New Testament is filled with the idea that God will make his people holy. And true believers who resist chastening hardships of the Father may well be taken on home. Witness Ananias and Sapphira in the book of Acts, as well as the abusers of the Lord's table at Corinth. Shocking. Because of this, your unwillingness to acknowledge everyone as in the body, because of this, some are sick, and some sleep, a euphemism for death. What? It's a serious thing. So, I'm sorry, let us not treat this lightly as though the only thing at stake is a little emotional distress. It's a serious thing to fall in the hands of a living God. So my beloved, do not resist the chastening of God. Submit to it, endure it with a sense of joy in the future. Bow down your heart when it wants to chafe under the hand of God. Bend your will to the holy will of God. Hardships gladly submitted to will profit us so much more. Listen to these strange and startling and soul-stirring words penned many years ago by Thomas Brooks in the book I've alluded to, The Mute Christian Under the Rod. He writes, Why must Christians be mute and silent under the greatest afflictions, the saddest providences, the sharpest trials? I answer, that they may better hear and understand the voice of the rod, that they may distinguish themselves from the world, that they may be like Christ their head, who was dumb and silent under his sorest trials. He was oppressed, he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter. And yet, Christians, it is a mercy, it is a rich mercy that every affliction is not an execution, that every correction is not your condemnation, the more your afflictions are increased, the more your heart shall be raised heavenward. Afflictions are the golden key by which the Lord opens the rich treasure of his word to the souls of his people. O oh, Christian, kiss the hand that wields the rod. End quote. And it is for our good verses 10 through 11. Here's the reason we ought to submit to the Father of lights whose hand is chastening us. It is for our good. It's for our holiness. Verse 10, they disciplined us for a short time as seemed best to them, referring to our earthly fathers. But he disciplines us for our good. In other words, as what seems best to him. And we may share in his holiness. For the moment, all discipline seems painful. Rather than pleasant, but later it yields a peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. How does he argue this? First, by contrast to our earthly fathers, they whom we are to respect disciplined us for a short time, uh oh, (laughs) and as best they could. 
Clear intent is to show that earthly fathers, even when correcting and chastening children, are very limited in what they do and how long they can do it, but not so with God. He not only knows perfectly what is good for us, but he also knows what he is aiming for. The ultimate aim is our holiness. That shapes the good for us. We could possibly say here that God is perfectly his designing his chastening to be good for our holiness. And second, by comparison to the cultivating and harvesting of fruit by a skilled farmer, he starts by asserting what all of us know in our hearts but don't like to admit. The pain of chastening is worth the gain that it brings. All discipline is by design supposed to be painful. And yet it is also supposed to cultivate and yield righteousness. The peace that comes from becoming holy sons and daughters is what is pleasant. And what it takes to produce it may not be. In fact, it won't be. But what it produces is one of the great paradoxes of the Christian life. And third, by asserting the value of its process. Notice why he says this. Those trained by it. We talk about discipline. We called it child training. And this is very important. The wise and good discipline of a sovereign God benefits those who are submissive to it. And profit from it. And therefore are trained by it. If you resist the chastening of God, then you won't profit and you won't be trained. And it just gets worse. So be the kind of son and daughter who looks up in the face of your loving father who is affirming your relationship with you and exhibited his wisdom to you and is training you in holiness through the hardship he directs to you. Be the kind of person who believes by faith that this pain is bringing oh so much a greater gain. Believe by faith. He is chastening for your good and his glory. Some questions as we close. What is God working in your life now? Some of you are experiencing a season of blessing. Others of you are experiencing a season of hardship. And God is behind both of these for your good and for his glory. Do not become weary. Do not become small-souled. Do not forget what the Bible tells you. Endure as under the discipline and and chastening of God. How is he bringing this chastening to you? Your life will almost certainly not have the same details as in this text, but you will suffer hardship and hostility. And God may bring illness or financial distress or family struggles or opposition, personal difficulties, or even the shocking one, spiritual dryness. Whatever it is in your life, you must see it and welcome it and be changed by it. Now are you responding to that discipline? We'll rejoice in that we are assured that we are his children. We'll rejoice to know for certain he loves me. You should find real rest in knowing that his hand is showing his love even in the hardship. And will righteousness or rebellion be its fruit? Will we be subject to the Father of Spirits and live? Or will we rebel against the Father of Spirits and die? Will we trust Him? If we submit to this sovereign, loving, fatherly care, we will not grow weary, we will not lose heart, but we will keep faith, fight the good fight, finish our course and die well, and glorify our Father is in heaven. Look to Jesus, consider Him who endured for you. Kiss the hand that wields the rod. Father, Father, we are your sons and daughters. Thank you for the hardship and the suffering, for the cross and the opposition of people, that by it we know we are yours and that you love us. May what you are doing in our lives as we submit to it yield that peaceable fruit of righteousness.
may we learn to kiss the hand that wields the rod, for it is your 